Hello, and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB, and I'm still recording late at night after my 4th of July shenanigans, if you watch my daily Dex video channel. And we are back. The, re the results of the poll that I put on YouTube was overwhelming. Mono black. The people want mono black. Over, over a thousand people voted. Uh, in a poll that I posted in my community posts. So I better, I hope, I see a thousand people watching this video. Remember to share it with your friends if they're thinking about getting into Magic or Magic Arena. I would love the support. We still have to play against the Sparkster, but we can uh, liven up our collection a little and open some packs. So let's get to it. All right, um, anything playable here? We might build a gate deck at some point. It's usually pretty budget friendly. And we have Bounty of Might. Mm -mm, it's a green card, it's okay. Uh, we might play it early on. There's a lot of, there's more pressure on these packs than I have on my other account, that's for sure, to give us some playable cards. Disdainful Stroke can do it. Wild cards are always welcome. I guess it was a good idea to go black, you guys. How did you know? There's Doom Whisperer, a mythic rare. That card is going to come in handy. Don't worry, we'll get to see most of the cards in action and go over exactly what they do later. Unmoored Ego is a Demir card that has very specific uses, but isn't exactly what we're looking for in our free-to-play account, I don't think. Not yet. So, on to Ravnica Allegiance. If you're wondering where these packs came from, these are what we got using free codes. Bedeck is a removal spell we can use in mono black because the hybrid mana symbols can be paid with two swamps if necessary, which is nice. If you want those free codes, check out episode one of the young CGB. I'll only make that mistake a hundred times. The free to play, the F2P CGB video series. This is episode two. You may want to watch episode one to see stuff in order. Verity Circle. Kind of an oddball card. Not a lot of uses, but maybe we'll see it get some play on the free-to-play account. Where there's a more limited collection, we're going to have to use more parts of, well, more of the tools in the toolbox that norm don't normally get played when we have access to a ton of mythics. Speaking of mythics, Prime Speaker Xanifer might be very fun in a Simic-type build. On to War of the Spark. Chandra's Triumph is a good red card. Aid the Fallen can be a good black card if we open some Planeswalkers. We will prevail. Well, that is a boss. Nissa Who Shakes the World is one of the best cards in Standard. When we get into green, we're gonna have to give her a shot. Vizier of the Scorpion might make our deck. Soren's Thirst probably will. I can no longer stand by and watch. <laughs> the world wants me to play Teferi. The fairy is a very good card. It's also specifically in blue and white, and a playstyle that we're probably not going to be chasing right away. Mainly control or tempo. Roll reversal is an interesting one that we might want to try out in a blue-red deck if we have the right mix of cards. The Davriel Shadow Mage will probably make our black deck. Another Soren's Thirst is another good removal spell. Are they your memories or mine? Jace. Rare. Hello, Jace. Welcome to the party. If we ever get into blue, we'll play with you. Hmm. Not a lot here. The Raise the Alarm is probably the best card so far, so let's hope for a nice Safara Sky's Blade. If we can open enough flyers, maybe a blue-white deck or a mono-white deck can feature this card. There's Duress, which will most certainly make our black deck. And Agent of Treachery, which for seven mana gains control of a permanent when it enters the battlefield. And you don't have to give it back. I like this card a lot. There's a Reanimator deck with Quasi-Duplicate that I really want to play using that card. The Yorox Fenlurker might make our deck because of the ability to hit the opponent's hand early. If fighting tooth and claw is what it takes, then so be it. Another Planeswalker, a Johnny Strength of the Pride. Lots of Planeswalkers. Of course, we did go through War of the Spark, which has a lot of Planeswalkers. But it's still nice to see that we'll probably have Planeswalkers in whatever deck we get into. Cavalier Flame is a mythic, but it's probably one of the more 
probably one of the worst mythics in the set, to be honest. So I would have preferred to open just about any other cavalier. <laughs> oh well, we can't get too picky now, can we? Let's get to the decks. So here's the decks that we've been given. You guys voted overwhelmingly, almost half of you voted for mono black. Mono black will probably be a tough one to make work because mono black doesn't have a clear identity. Should it be aggressive? Should it be controlling? It's gonna be very difficult to pin it down. The deck as we're given is a little bit of both. You have cards like Murder and Soren's Thirst. Wow, I opened a whole bunch of these, but I get four of them. That's kind of annoying. But again, can't get too upset. So are we aggressive or are we controlling? We have a lot of removal spells, but we also have cards like Dark Remedy that pump our Child of Night and just some vampire tribal stuff, but I don't think we have any payoffs. Spinal Centipede dies, put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature you control. That's not very good. Um, Vindictive Vampire, pretty medium card and no zombie payoffs. So yeah, this is an interesting mix. So let's look around. Do we want a Dreadmaw Kin? I've come around on this as a little zombie cat a bit. It's better than some of the cards already in our deck, so I think we can add it. Sacrificing another creature for two plus one plus one counters isn't great if we don't have any value creatures. So we're going to have to find them. Duress, I think, gets played for sure, especially while there's a Planeswalker set in the meta. Duress can take Planeswalkers out of the hand. Aid the Fallen returns a creature or, and a Planeswalker to our hand. When you can return two things, this is a good card. When you return one thing, this is a bad card. So I'm going to be looking to see if I have Planeswalkers to get back. I know I have a Davriel, but I think I need more than that. Yeah, there you are, Davriel. Go ahead and get in there. Bloodthirsty Aerialist is in the deck. I don't know if we'll have the lifelink for this, but we'll try. I'm curious to try out the Fenlurker. This is a 2 mana 2-1, two but at 7 mana, each opponent loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. That's not great. Soren's Thirst. Yeah, it's a reprint. I was just checking to see if these two cards were exactly the same, and they are. The Deathbloom Thalid is a little bit resilient. When it dies, a 1-1 one, one Sapperling enters the battlefield, at least giving you some value there. Similar value from Vizier of the Scorpions. We'll try that. I'm not a big fan of Never Happened. Three mana for this effect is a bit too much. The Carrion Imp. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile target creature card from a graveyard. If you do, gain two life. It's a way to gain life, but it's really overpriced, quite honestly, for a 2-3 flyer. We may have to play some cards like this, but I want to avoid it as much as I can. Fathom Fleet Cutthroat enters the battlefield, destroy target creature, and opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. We may just want to play that because we want removal or some kind of control, but we already have a lot of things with Death Touch, which I think makes it a pretty bad card. I guess it's a little bit of a combo with a Soren's Thirst, but 6 mana at that point, which is way too much. Mm. This is going to be tough. We're going to have to lean on Doom Whisperer, who is going straight into the deck and is going to try to carry us big time. What else? I suppose we've got all these Meteor Golems. We could play a whole bunch of Meteor Golems. <laughs> I mean, is four Meteor Golems even an option here? We could play cards like Firemind Vessel and Mana Geo to cast them, and it might be stronger than a lot of what our deck is doing, because quite honestly, Meteor Golem, while extremely overpriced, is a two for one that can take out all kinds of threats from the opponent. The Bedeck can get in there as a solid removal spell. I have to remember that, but, hmm. <laughs> it's very tempting, though, to play a little bit of ramp and all the Meteor Golems and try to play like a black control deck. Because, quite honestly, I'm not sure how we're going to win. Our creatures are very slow. Yeah, we don't have enough life gain to really make this a very good card. I feel like we have to play it uh, just to go with the Soren's Thirst. And this is whenever a creature you control dies. Well, that sucks because we don't actually want our creatures to die that often. None of them like have a lot of value effects when they go to the graveyard. I guess the Vampire of the Dire Moon is the best combo we have with the Aerialist. It's probably time to cut some things. I like you, but I think you have to go. I don't see myself sacrificing these creatures. None of them have value when sacrificed. They barely have value when they enter the battlefield. Dark Remedy seems like a card I should trim. Child of Night has Lifelink, so the Lifelink cards have to stay. 
to at least combo with some of our other life gain cards. I think the opportunist is pretty bad. So that has to get out of here. Maybe. We might end up putting it back in. I think that the centipede is very bad. So I want to take that out of the deck. Vindictive can probably stay. Maybe we can go up to two meteor golems. And let's look at our curve. We have 20 creatures, 25 land. It's not terrible. And it might be able to compete with red because of all of our life gain. Although we don't have a way to stop an experimental frenzy if we run up, up against a red deck that's unlocked all of its cards. But I think it will do well against Sparky for now. So let's fire it up. But first, you'll need to choose a deck. You can change your deck before we each game. It says that there's red in the deck. That's only because of the B-Deck Bedazzle, which I don't use the other effect from. I could run like a guild gate or one of the red black lands to use it, but I don't know if that's worth having an enter the battlefield tap effect. I guess one of those lands enters the battlefield and you gain a life, which can be a trigger for our life gain cards, which I think we only have two, but small synergy. <laughs> Yay, friendly. Small synergies are sometimes all you get in free to play. So we get both of our Vampires of the Dire Moon down and we start attacking with them while Sparky is undefended. We gain a life each time and if they touch a creature of our opponents, that creature will die no matter its size because of death touch. The opponent plays a Child of Night. We could disfigure it or we could Soren's Thirst it. I like saving the Soren's Thirst because the life gain might do something later in the game. <laughs> Sparky's already telling me to play faster, that's nice. However, this channel, one of the tenets of it is to explain what I do and why I do it. So I will be taking my time most of the time. If I play too slowly, you do have the option of 2x speed. You can hit the gear. It's down there in the corner, your settings. There's an option for speed. You can select 2x. You'll hear me talk like a chipmunk. The games will go faster. No need to leave a comment telling me I play slow. This is part, this is a um, feature, not a bug. Here, though, it's very straightforward. Our opponent's not giving us to anything to kill, and we're just slamming away with these vampires. While in the meantime, all we draw are swamps. Our opponent has a vindictive vampire. How fun. So now whenever another creature they control dies, one damage to each opponent, and you gain a life. Do I wish to kill this? I'm not very afraid of it. I could keep attacking and trade my vampire the dire moon for it. I'm at 27, my opponent's at 13. I think I'll just sit still. It's okay to take your time. If the, if the vampire attacks me, that's interesting. Well, that can, I can sort of thirst that. Whoa. This is going to get really funky. Okay, the opponent's all up on spinal centipedes. No blocks, take the damage. On your end step, I'll well, Soren's Thirst your centipede. Let's see what our opponent targets with the centipede's death a trigger. And it is... Where will you target? Okay, targets the vampire. Now I'll fire off on the other centipede as well. It will also target the vampire. But now Bone Splinters or a Vampire of the Dire Moon can take it out. It's a lot of land to draw. Pretty unfortunate. My opponent's at 15, I'm at 27. This doesn't have lifelink. I think I can keep crashing in at least for a little while. When my opponent plays another creature, the attacks are probably over. And we both have seven lands. I think the algorithm served us up a lot of hurt. Ooh. I need this in my deck. That's really good value to get back two creatures. All right, we'll pass. We could use the bone, bone splinters to kill something, but since these have death touch, blocking will accomplish the same thing. Let's see what the opponent puts the counter on. I don't really care about the drains too much. They're not gaining too much. It's, it's very tiny value. The lands are starting to tilt me. My opponent's on 8 and I'm on 9, though. Okay, at least it's even. 
I don't want to block here because this creature's holding off the vampire, so two points come in, life is gained. Hey! It's our rare. Sweet. And it's something to do with all this extra mana. Because now we can use it to make our Knight of the Ebon Legion huge. Alright. With nine mana, this can be a one, two, three, four, five, six. This can be too big, is what it is. It's way too big. So it can safely swing in. The vampire will block it. Pump. Four, five, five, six. Pump. Seven, eight, five, six. Big creature dead. May as well keep playing the land since we have a vampire to pump up. It's a very powerful card, in indeed. I still don't want to trade the Dire Moon for the Child of Night, so this is fine. I can deal plenty more damage. 11 lands for the opponent. <laughs> it's been a weird shuffle. Let's use Davriel's Shadow Mage. The minus one makes our opponent discard a card. A mind is a terrific and when the opponent way. has uh, one or fewer cards in hand, it deals two damage to them. So we'll get some extra damage in with this card now. Our opponent discarded Agonizing Siphon. Three damage to any target and you gain three life. Interesting. They didn't want to use it on the vampire. Perhaps they are slow rolling their removal spells here. Should I go for the extra damage? Or, since my opponent discarded a removal spell, should I assume they may have another and I might want to pump this to save it? We know that Soren's Thirst is a card in this type of deck, now we've seen the Siphon. So let's not pump for the last points of damage. I know, you're surprised. This way, if the opponent has another one of these, we can pump to save our knight. The opponent will Child of Night our Davriel, and it's okay. I'm okay with letting that go. Ooh, murder. That's very sad. Maybe I should have saved the Vampire of the Dire Moon. Now we have another Child of Night to summon. And we're just bouncing lifelink off of each other. We have a small advantage in life. Okay. Now I feel like I can play you and threaten to trade a Child of Night for a Child of Night. There we go. Gets a little drain. Kick it on back. Three cards in hand. Not doing much. Let's play another Vindictive Vampire. Now we get double the effect that when a creature dies, the opponent gets drained is what we call it when they lose a life and we gain a life in magic going back to a card from the very beginning of the game called drain life some of the old school magic jargon 12 lands for the opponent 10 for us the landlording's intense but there's doom whisper our power card is ready we're going to play it post combat in case the opponent is slow rolling a card like murder here Whoa. You could say let's hold this back, but thanks to the surveil ability and because we have 28 life, we can basically use it to draw another big threat next turn, as we can pay 2 life to surveil 2 whenever we want to, as long as we control Doom Whisperer. Child of Night, here we go. Opponent is very close to dead. So during my upkeep, I'm going to put a stop there. If the opponent wanted to kill this, I'd like to know about it first, but let's see if we can make sure we draw a good card this turn with the Surveil ability. The Aerialist is a good card, so I'll take it. I definitely don't need any more swamps for the rest of the game. And now you see why Doom Whisperer is a Mythic Rare, because you can make your draw that much better with it. Let's play the Aerialist first, because when we attack, we want to gain some life. Uh, we could just attack in the air. We could also sacrifice something with the blown splinters. I suppose that's pretty good. Let's sacrifice you. It's lethal even if the opponent can somehow kill the Doom Whisperer. And these little pips of life, procs of life, will increase the size of this aerialist in case we actually end up needing it. But it looks like the opponent's dead. I can only wonder what's in their hand. What three cards are you not playing, Sparky? All 
By the way, this thing over here is Sparky's pet cat. Sparky gets a pet. We don't have one. Kind of weird. Okay, our reward. We got a black and a red orb. Interesting. Is that because of the Bedeck Bedazzle in our deck? What's this? All right. There's new cards in every direction. But which path to choose? Ooh. They're seeing Bloodlord. So because we got this, we get another Child of Night, I guess. Upgrade deck. Sure, get in there. One step closer to becoming the best. And we get you, sure. Alright, so we've got this orb. Let's head into black. As this is the first set we're going to or the first deck we're going to try to master. Those can go in there. I wonder what the I wonder what the computer will take out. All right. So coming up next, we can go get some of these great cards or some of these great cards. Uh, looks like both might be good in our deck. Although I'm much bigger fan of Bolas's Citadel. Let's go work on the build for a minute. So these got added to the deck. What got taken out? The something definitely got taken out, and it looks like Bone Splinters came out. I agree with that. I would cut the Bone Splinters just because we don't want to sacrifice our creatures, something I pointed out before. So I'm all about that change. Two Soren's Thirst were cut. Do I agree with that? Soren's Thirst might be better overall for the deck. It provides a life bonus. It's good against Red, who is my arch nemesis in life. I guess we can try it with a few less of them, but it feels like Soren's Thirst is a pretty good card. Maybe I'll end up wrong about that. So, I was saying I could add these Bloodfell Caves because when they enter the battlefield, I gain a life. I think I'll need more cards like the Aerialist before I really want to do that. More ways to pay off the life gain, but it is an option. We might be able to do it later, and then we could cast the other side of Bedazzle, maybe someday, although I don't think it will be useful very soon. All right. Ooh, more quests. You'll get another one every day. Hallelujah. So, Donnie, there's just so much to look forward to. Every day you get to reroll one quest, and you should, because if you can hit a 750 gold quest instead of a 500, that's more gold. So every day you should pick one of your quests to try to reroll it. Possibly the one you probably won't achieve today. So what else do we need? I guess we get this if we get a bit more EXP. This is for our daily wins. This is a pack when we get enough EXP. I'm still trying to learn how these mastery things work, so bear with me. They're new in Core 2020. For the most part, I think the gist is win your darn games. So, let's go play. Um, they still want me to play a bot? I can't reach level 3 to unlock additional play modes. So I have to beat Sparky again? I don't have a choice? So it would seem... All right, Sparky. I'll get you. I will get you. All right. Lots of removal. Sparky usually plays creatures, though. Still brought this cat. <laughs> Sparky and, her, Sparky and Sparky's cat, friends for life. Vizier the Scorpion, and there's a battlefield, mass one, which means make a 1-1 one, one zombie. Hmm. Trample, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, plus one plus oh until end of turn. That looks like a really good target for my B deck, which will give it minus three plus three, since it has three toughness, it will die. Turns into a four zero, but of course zero means you go to the graveyard. So, I could play the Shadow Mage and hit my opponent's hand a few times. I think it's better to get the Vizier out, just to have some blockers on the battlefield in front of the Shadow Mage in case our opponent has a creature with haste. Something that can come down like a... I think there's a Pilgrim that's a 3-1 haste that is in these decks. Alright, so these have this has Death Touch, so the opponent won't want to block it unless they want to lose their 3-2. Let's give them that option. Would you like to lose your 3-2? No. 
All right, we'll play a Vampire of the Dire Moon, which also has Death Touch, and we'll play the Shadow Mage. Shadow Mage can hit the opponent's hand a few times. And a Mountain hits the graveyard. It's possible we could have waited a little while longer to play Davriel. Here comes the 3-2. The Vampire of the Dire Moon can trade with it. Because of Death Touch, off you go. Let's pick on the opponent's hand a little bit more. I don't think you'll be needing that. Sacrifice an artifact or a land to draw a card. I guess I don't want my opponent to pitch their lands to fill their hand back up since we're attacking it with Shadow Mage. So let's murder this. And now that I've already gotten two cards out of the Shadow Mage's abilities, I'm not as scared of a haste creature killing it. So I'm going to go ahead and get some attacks in since the damage could matter. Chandra Spitfire. This is a 1-3 flyer. Whenever an opponent is dealt non-combat damage, plus three, plus O oh, until end of turn. You gotta die. That can become a very large, very powerful creature. We could wait and see what the opponent does, but I think if we're going to kill it, we may as well just kill it. So do we keep the Shadow Mage? Or do we cash it in for one more card? The damage could be relevant if the opponent plays out a few more spells. So let's hang on to Shadow Mage for just a little while. The last minus would kill it. Each creature you control named Pack Mastiff gets plus one plus O. Oh. And this gains flying. Activate this ability only if you control a creature with flying. So now our opponent is down to one card. They'll take two damage from the Shadow Mage. We can hold these back to D up. This at instant speed can take out the Mastiff. So let's see if the opponent decides to pump mana into this card to try to make it bigger. No attacks, probably because of the Death Touch creature. So I'm fine waiting. The opponent also holds their card, probably because Shadow Mage and its damage. So may as well keep this around. As long as it's here, the opponent may be careful about playing one card per turn, and if they play more than that, they take damage, so it's fine. Man, the Storm does five damage to target creature. Well, I can't stop that. Now let's see if the opponent wants to try to attack down the Shadow Mage. Here comes the Mastiff. Let's go ahead and disfigure it. The opponent still didn't want to trade the Bird Grabber with the 1-1. One -one. And our opponent's down to just one more card. It can't be very good, or they probably would have played it, so I'm still going to hang on to my Shadow Mage to get the damage from it. Loneliness can hurt. Not sure what would make me cash this in, but just about every deck that Sparky plays has a Meteor Golem, so that might be the card in the hand. And maybe I should cash this in. Especially when uh, Sparky is playing out the lands, despite the fact that it deals damage to them for it. I could have attacked with the Vampire. Hmm. Hmm. Wonder if I was supposed to, to be honest. Land, land, land. Now I don't want to attack with a vampire. I really don't want to trade it with these two. But still getting that Shadow Mage damage. Trying to get the opponent in range where we can finish him off. Third bird grabber. Oh no. Can we draw something to deal? Well, I'm going to keep this in my hand, but Spark, well, against a human, I would hold on to this and make them afraid to attack because it might uh, do something, but oh well. So would I rather hit this card or deal two damage? Let's deal two damage. The opponent attacking their bird grabbers into the vampire will put, leave them very low on life because when this dies, they lose two gain two, two of their bird grabbers would die. So I think this is the way we want it. Child of Night. Hmm. I'm trying to decide if I want to attack with the 1-1. One -one. If the Bird Grabber trades with it, they still take one. And I guess it's a decent trade for me. And defending Davriel isn't that useful anymore. Mm. 
Of course, I do have ways to make my zombies bigger, but a 2-2 and a 1-1 aren't that different when my opponent has three 2-1 creatures on the battlefield. Down to four. All right, let's pass the turn. We've got them on the edge. Okay, well, the Fen Lurker will take a card out of the opponent's hand and is a creature that can get pumped. But let's send in some damage because the opponent is going to have to block to defend their life total or they may just lose. I still don't want to lose my Vindictive Vampire because the drain ability from it might help finish the opponent off. wonder why our opponent blocked with both. I guess Sparky does Sparky things. Exile a card from your hand. And the card was Infuriate, plus three. Okay, I, I don't know how to explain what Sparky does here, going hmm and mmm. Sparky makes some weird plays, my friends, because that Infuriate could have helped keep a creature alive. Gravewalker, return target card, target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Well, isn't that a glorious creature, but I don't think we'll need you. It's all, all the humming. <laughs> I really want to get to play humans. I'm ready. I'm telling you, Sparky, I'm ready. You got me. Okay, we got another orb, we got 500 gold. Where do we want it? I like this one better. Yes, I do. Upgrade. I don't know what the uh, AI will take out, but I think we can go ahead and play a game. Hopefully they don't take out all the good stuff. Am I ready? I'm ready. To ranked. So there are two ways to look at things. There's arena play modes and there's all play modes. Under all play modes, well, they, they kept a lot of this stuff locked up for whatever reason. Sure, are we done? Can I do the things? This is interesting. So I have arena modes on. When I switch to all play modes, I see everything when I switch to arena play modes. Okay, now it works. It was showing me a lot of things. So I'm gonna have arena play modes on, most people do, but as you see, there's traditional ranked, which is best two out of three. There's other draft sets and events you can play. I like a simplified menu and I like best of one. So I'll be playing in ranked best of one most of the time. From the very beginning. All right, disfigured child of night, vindictive vampire, and a grave walker. Why not? Why not? Curious to see what decks look like down here. Are we going to play somebody who just got their account and bought a whole bunch of cards? Or are we going to play somebody with an account similar to ours? So a Sunhome Stalwart is a 2-2 First Strike Mentor, and definitely worthy of a Disfigure, as it's just a creature that will be in our way and not let our Child of Night do awesome things. First Strike means, of course, that the uh, Stalwart would kill our Child of Night without our Child of Night killing the Stalwart. And there's another one. So, we can kill this and get him for two life. I like playing out the Aerialist instead, though. If the opponent doesn't pump their Stalwart, this can block and kill the Stalwart, so it may not attack. And if they do, and they leave back a blocker, maybe we can remove it and grow our Aerialist by hitting the opponent with our Child of Night. Because anytime we gain life, we get a plus one, plus one counter for our Aerialist. Again, we don't want to attack with the Child Knight now. First Strike actually kills the Child Knight before it deals damage. 
so there'll be no life gain there. It won't even grow our aerialist if we attack with the Child of Night in that situation. Our opponent appears to be on blue-white. Let's see what they've got. A Thirsting Bloodlord could come down next turn and grow our vampires, but our opponent has one with the wind, giving the Sunhome Stalwart plus two plus two and flying. So now it can no longer be killed by the Disfigure and it gets a massive hit in. On the bright side, we drew the land. So here's Thirsting Bloodlord, increasing the size of our vampires. They can both attack, we'll gain three life, and our aerialist will become a 4-5, which means it's bigger now than even the Stalwart. That is for as long as the Thirsting Bloodlord lives. If this dies somehow, it goes back to being a 3-4, along with the Child of Night going back to a 2-1. We'll wait for our opponent to find the play, and it's Seal Away, an enchantment that takes the Aerialist off the board. Ouchie. And the Sun Home Stalwart will keep attacking, which I don't actually think is a very good move from our opponent with a Child of Night on the field to gain that life back. And look at that top deck. Another one. And I think that getting it onto the battlefield to start growing it with the Child of Night's lifelink right away is the right move, despite having a 4-mana Vindictive Vampire in hand as well. The opponent's all the way down to 8 life. We still have 18. So we're well ahead. There's a Blade Instructor. It's a 3-1 Mentor. Anything else? Oftentimes in creature face-offs, like happen with budget decks in the early stages of playing Magic Arena, and also in Draft and Limited if you ever play those different formats and events like Sealed, you want to save your removal spells until the very last moment. You don't want to use it too early. You want to save it for exactly the right time to blow the opponent out. This figure can kill a smaller creature like Blade Instructor. It can also reduce the power of a bigger creature like this Stalwart so that a smaller creature could kill it. Let's play the Vindictive Vampire. Whenever another creature you control dies, the Vampire deals one damage to each opponent, and you gain one life. Then, let's send in the Aerialist, I believe. We could kill the Instructor and attack with everything, and that would put... Would that kill our opponent, actually? Because of the Vindictive Vampire, when the Stalwart blocks here, they would lose one. Well, if the Stalwart blocked the Thirsting Bloodlord, and the opponent would kill it with first strike, which would shrink our other creatures. So their attack wouldn't be lethal. Let's see, they go to seven, then they take one, two, three, four, five. They go to two. So I don't think it's worth it. Instead, and I am more I'm I am a pretty conservative player by nature. That shouldn't surprise you if you play with me or watch me play for a while. We're just going to send in this one creature because the opponent doesn't have a good block on it with its five toughness versus the uh, four power of the stalwart. So first strike damage first, and then our damage. The stalwart dies, we can pass the turn. Our opponent still has four cards. You've got to, you got to believe some of them do something helpful. It's another Sunhome Stalwart. Our opponent loves Mentor cards, and they've got some auras in blue. Just hasn't been a very good uh, draw to them this turn. Wow, the Instructor wants to attack. I will not block. I, I mean, I could block here. I mean, let's see. The opponent might have a trick. If they do, we have a Disfigure to respond with. It must have some kind of trick. Disperse. Okay. This returns to my hand. The opponent must be pretty new. You want to use a disperse before a block, not after, because this creature was still blocked. Now we can fire off a disfigure, kill the only blocker our opponent has, and attack for more than 8 damage to finish the game. A 
lock it in. Our first two points on the ladder with our free-to-play account. Let this moment be etched in history for all of time. 250 gold, some XP. So we want to make sure we get to three wins a day, I think is how it works with the mastery tree. I'm Honestly, I would love to act like I'm a level, an expert on the mastery tree, but it's pretty new and I frankly don't get it most of the time. But I think what I'm supposed to do is get three wins a day. At least. I'm supposed to at least complete whatever these quests are. So, carrying on. Right, there's our Bolus's Citadel, along with a Vampire, the Dire Moon, and a Disfigure, which is fine. Four mana means we'll probably get to the Citadel. The Vampire and the Disfigure can keep us from getting run over quickly. Let's see what our opponent would like to do. Aya! Redheads. You gotta love them. The only Vanguard, our opponent has a small creature of their own. I think I want to hold on to the Disfigure. I don't think I even want to trade with the Vanguard. But, so a Johnny's Pride Mate is a 2-2 two -two for 2 that can gain when you gain life becomes bigger and is often the cornerstone of decks like this, the kind of white cat decks. And I think I want to save a Disfigure for um, that kind of card. Sacred Foundry is a rare dual land, which I didn't expect to play this early in my Magic Arena experience, but we'll see. It's unclear if our opponent has like a more formed deck than we do, or they just happen to open this. Wow, that's another rare land. So this, uh, this looks like our opponent might have uh, built up their collection a bit already. Maybe I'm crazy about that. Maybe there's a way to earn these early on in the mastery tree that I'm not, um, I'm not familiar with. And so far, Bugler into Bugler means our opponent's going to have all kinds of awesome stuff, while we have not very much awesome stuff, to be honest. We got trouble. All we've drawn our land, and that's a mythic rare rekindling phoenix. I'm pretty sure we can't kill that. And I don't think this is going to be a game. We've only drawn three spells. They were in our opening hand. We've drawn nothing but land since. So... To get the most out of my vampire, I'll put a block here, and then what I'm going to show you, this has death touch, so any damage it deals will kill this creature, but before the damage happens, I'm going to use a disfigure to give this minus two, minus two, just like back with the assassin in Sparky. So the bugler dies, and I keep my vampire. Well, this does something. Makes the opponent discard one of their five cards that they still have in hand. And they exile an extra planes. I don't know, They their deck is real. Whereas my deck is very intro. 100% intro pack. Don't think matchmaking was on my side for this one. Of course, just wait till we fight full-blown like Esper Control in bronze. Just you wait. There's the Ajani's Pride Mate right after I spent the Disfigure. Ouch. Opponent moving to combat here. And it's the Phoenix and nothing else coming at me. The Vampire could trade with either one of these, and the Fen Lurker could get pumped and trade with the Vanguard. Weird. The opponent didn't play out their Pride Mate to get their life gain trigger from the uh, Vanguard. They could have had a 3 3 Pride Mate. Maybe they have something else in mind. Bolus' Citadel will have to be a real miracle worker. My god, the land. I bet there's a land on top right now. Oh, well, it's something. <gasps> Duress. That's another one-drop card. 
history of Benalia, another mythic rare. But is Make a Stand strictly better here? Make a Stand giving all creatures indestructible means that the death touch creatures would die. I think I have to take Make a Stand away from my opponent. And why didn't they play a Johnny's Pride Mate? Another duress. Oh my goodness. And suddenly the deck is cooking. So, I hit another land. I need to attack with this to start growing my Aerialist. If I hit with it, the life gain trigger will make my Aerialist bigger. If we can get this to a 4-5, it can hold off the Rekindling Phoenix. We're trying. We're fighting the good fight. Very lucky, quite honestly, to hit those two duresses. <laughs> Alright, the opponent took the damage. I love that because we get to keep our vampire around. Here's Primate, which will grow thanks to the Vanguard. But our Aerialist might grow faster. A block here is not good. This will turn into an egg and then come back next turn. Whereas the Aerialist, we need to let it get big enough to hold this off. Another swamp on top. And another vampire. Alright, we gotta watch our life total. But I think it's time to play this stuff. There's a murder. I think the trick here is to attack with our creatures first and see how the opponent wants to block. I don't know if I want to attack with you though. Being forced into pumping it to kill something just doesn't seem very good to me. Let's send these for their life gain. Hmm. Why haven't these tapped? There we go. A little bit of a lag of some kind, I guess. Alright, let's deal that damage. To life, grow the aerialist. Now, if I play this, and the opponent draws something to kill this, that's pretty bad news. It means that we lose the game on the spot. And I think I can play more carefully from this spot. So I'm going to let this stay here, and it might turn out to be a mistake. But I'm willing to make it. I'm conservative by nature. You can be a more aggressive player if you wish, and sometimes that will be right. Another Sacred Foundry. Yeah, our opponent has the land. They don't seem to have, like, all Mythic Rares. Bugler and Vanguard you don't see too often, but they seem to have the, the rare land cycle. Okay. I'm passing it back to me. I'll draw the murder. We'll play the land off the top. 7 mana for a Meteor Golem is too much. Alright. I think the trick is to keep the vampires coming. I could also attack with a Fen Lurker. But uh, the Pride Mate could block it and really smash it. Let's keep them coming. We need the life and we need the Aerialist bigger. So Rekindling Phoenix blocking is pretty fun. This will die, the phoenix will die. Two triggers. The phoenix will come back as an egg. But now, my friends, now is the time to fire off that murder. This way the rekindling phoenix will not come back from the graveyard. Also, I'm going to keep this meteor golem here. I'm not going to pay seven for seven life. No thank you. I'm going to go ahead and draw it. And now we have a 7-8 flyer, and our opponent has no flying creatures. They're, they've drawn a bunch of land, while Bolas' Citadel has helped us find more and more spells, which is exactly what the card is designed to do. The more spells you get to cast, the more likely you are to win the game. It's not always who casts the most spells, but it often is. Reconnect! Oh no! Oh no! No, I was I was epic comebacking. Wait, did I win? I'm pretty sure that this shows that I won. Right? I think that's a win. And now it has. Yep. Okay. So, I think I have a new orb. I do. All right. 
go here. Give me some new fresh stuff. Um, upgrade the deck. Let's have a look at what the uh, what the AI is doing to this deck before we play the next game. What have they taken out? They've taken out some Child of Knights. I can approve this. They take out most of the Soren's Thirst and the Deathbloom Thalid. I guess I, that's okay. The beginning of your end step. If an opponent lost life, put a counter on it. Okay. It's kind of a another like thing that grows. The Scorpion's still there. The Vindictives are in there. Now we have a Gruesome Menagerie. Do we have enough small creatures for Gruesome Menagerie to actually be good? I don't feel like it. We only have two two-drop creatures left, so I don't think Menagerie is actually a good card for the deck, to be honest. <laughs> they kept the two Meteor Golems. I think I'm better off with uh, a few... Let's see. This is a vampire, right? And it has lifelink, and we can play it with black mana. It's a 3-1 vampire. Is it better than a child of night? No, it's not. <laughs> Probably not at all. Um, I'm going to cut the menagerie because I don't have two drops to get back. But I guess getting back two creatures... Well, even then, I don't have that many three drops either. It just doesn't seem like it's that likely to be a good card. Oh, let's give it a chance. The AI worked really hard on this deck, you guys. Let's try to get one more win. Disfigure, Vampire, and two ways to pump it. Sure, let's try. Red, the nemesis. Of course, a turn one fanatical firebrand. So, do we play the vampire of the dire moon to trade with it, or do we play a disfigure to get rid of it? I think that this will die no matter what I do. So I'm going to play it as probably a trade with this firebrand. This is where you want Soren's Thirst in the deck. Oh no. An old mono red, huh? Two disfigures. Let's try attacking the opponent. Let's see what they do. Okay. Your turn. They let me gain life. I'm not complaining too much. I want to get them to attack with the firebrand instead of leaving it up. Okay, they brought they brought Goblin Chain Whirler to this fight. That's that's unfortunate. Card is amazing. Not attacking with the firebrand. Okay, they're also conservative by nature. Let's use a disfigure here. I don't want to use two disfigures on the Chain Whirler. I think that that's just asking for trouble. I'm going to put my faith in drawing a murder. That is a very, very expensive card. And not good in the face of Goblin Chain Whirler. Looks like our opponent's on full-blown, like, mono red. They crafted their Chain Whirlers. Mm. There's few things more annoying in the whole world than mono red. Man, that firebrand is scared. It's the most conservative firebrand I've seen in a while. Four mana. If I see Experimental Frenzy, I will probably concede on the spot. Just because at that point, it's like the best card in their deck. All right. I suppose I'll play this vampire, and if it lives, I'll play a Thirsting Bloodlord to make it bigger. The 
but there isn't much that can work out from here. I don't think we can possibly beat a real red deck. It's one of the best decks in the game, and to run into it at this stage is already just... What can you do? Now, we could overload our deck with cards like Th Soren's Thirst, but if our opponent crafted Experimental Frenzies and Chain Whirlers, those are better than those cards anyway, and we would still just lose to those. Yep. Runaway Steamkin, one of the best creatures in the game. Absolute must-answer threat that just completely wrecks everything in front of it. Mm-hmm. And at this point, it's a 3-3, too big for the disfigure, which means we've already lost. There's basically no way we can come back unless our opponent's hand is just so terrible. Well, we drew the swamp. We'll play a Bloody Lord. Hopefully the opponent just struggles to remove it, gets scared about of our growing creatures. And maybe this disfigure can still come into play somehow. Last card. I always assume their last card is a Lightning Strike, a Wizard's Lightning, and something like that is a total blowout. It's a, going to be a Lava Runner. They actually haven't played a spell yet. They've drawn all creatures. Kind of weird. Let's see what they do. Alright, those two are attacking. Anybody else? Just you two? Alright, so if I block here... The opponent shoots a firebrand at this. I can give it minus two, minus two, make it a one, one. They shoot another one. I'm still okay. Uh, if I block here and give it minus two, minus two, it can still trade with the firebrands, but I'm not dealing enough damage, so I'd have to disfigure in response. If their last card is a removal spell of some kind, all right, we'll go for it. Make our opponent make the first move. Okay. So this will be a 2-3, this will be a 1-1, one. 2-3, one, yep, all our stuff dies, but I don't think there was a way around it. I don't think there was any way around it. This will make the opponent sack their two firebrands. But our opponent's an experienced magic player. I don't know what they're doing in bronze with a full red deck. They should definitely... They probably just got into the game, and now they're climbing their way out of it. Everything about the way that they've played the game in the stack it reeks of experience. And they've got a real deck. So, I don't know what they're doing here. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and die because I don't want to play with them. This is the kind of person I... Like, like, we shouldn't be playing each other. If we're at a game store, I just wouldn't play. All right, so still needs one more win, I guess. I guess I get nothing for that loss. Feels bad. I'll try this hand. It's a nice curve. Can definitely run this. We have turn one duress, turn two removal spell, turn three aerialist, turn four bloodlord. Doing our thing. In theory. We'll see if we're against another full blown mono red. Oh hell, why not Esper Control? They've already got the Teferi Avatar. Let's just get turn turn one dual land, turn two thought erasured. Okay, this is fair. Uh, the Rustering Wing Falcons, the Giant's Pride Mate, the Triumph of Gerard, and Nahiri. As long as it's your turn. Creatures you control have first strike. This Nahiri deals X damage to a tapped creature. Hmm. 
trying to decide how good that is versus how good this is. It helps to look back at your own hand and see what you can answer. The Triumph of Gerard might be obnoxious, but I'm pretty sure I can answer the creatures that get the counter. The Nahiri is probably a lot worse, as it can probably kill any of our creatures when they decide to start attacking. Alright, we'll pass it over. The target for the B deck definitely wants to be the Pride Mate, but we want to wait until the Triumph of Gerard puts a counter on it so we at least get rid of that. Oh, okay. Hmm. I guess we can wait till next turn when this is on the stack. No, we can just kill it now, right? Because this will go off at the beginning of the next turn and miss. So if we use this now, it just won't. Our opponent just won't get the two counters. Very aggressive to play that on turn two, because now, without another creature, they're just going to get nothing for it. Like, the only thing that's going to happen is when chapter three goes, target creature you control gains flying, first strike, and lifelink until end of turn. It's just a one turn bonus. And will the creature even be able to attack if we have Thirsting Bloodlord here? Now, because of this going off, let's go ahead and hold this back. If our opponent, this, if this gains a lifelink, we want it to die if it comes flying over. Because remember, it gains flying. The Bloodlord couldn't block it. The Aerialist can. And there we go. Pass the turn. Love it. And... I guess our opponent was too tilted by the way that played out. All right. Well, we got we got back to bronze. We got to bronze three. We we fought our way forward. All right. So there's 100 gold. We got the XP and we got a booster pack. So lock it in. Let's go ahead and see what we get. Something good for mono black, I hope. Blood for Bones is an interesting reanimator spell. Epicure Blood's okay, uh, especially if we're on this life gain thing, maybe it will help. And Sacrifice Salvager of Ruin, choose target permanent card in your graveyard that was put there from the battlefield this turn to return it to your hand. Interesting card, maybe there's some ways to play it. Yeah, Mythic. So. We've got a little stash. We got five commons, six uncommons, two rares, and one mythic. At the end of the week, we'll go through. Well, let's say. Hmm. Maybe we wait. The, at some point, I'm going to go through and we're going to use some of these wild cards to make our deck better because we certainly need it. I'm just trying to decide what point that will be. If you have an opinion on that, sound off in comments and uh, let me know when I should be working on that. We'll work on black for probably a few more videos. And then we'll switch over to another color and work on that side of the mastery tree. Let's see, for tonight, we have filled this out and we have this cosmetic child of night to get, I guess, is the last thing. And then we have the black side knocked off and we can go play another side. We made some progress on the deck. I like some of the changes. I like some of the cards we picked up and we got some wins, so it's a good day. Thank you for watching this video on the free to play CGB account. As always, I'll see you in the next video and I hope to upload these videos every two to three days, depending on what's going on in my life. So I'll see you in, in kind of shout out to one of my favorite uh, players to ever do it. One of my favorite YouTubers to ever do it, Nighthawk. I will see you later.